Good evening. You kindly take your seats, please. Good evening and welcome. My name is Max Williams, uh, Division Marketing Manager of the Quality Systems Division at BioRad Laboratories. And on behalf of BioRad, I want to welcome you and really thank you for being with us for the next few hours on this important subject of quality control for the future and the foundation for a patient-centered laboratory. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dr. James Westgard, co-founder and president of Westgard QC and Professor Emeritus at University of Wisconsin at Madison. Dr. Westgard is a, a close friend and he's a consummate educator, author, and really a scion in the quality control thinking and quality control industry. And with nothing further ado, Dr. Westgard. Well, thank you. I am um, pleased to be here and I appreciate that all of you are taking time out of uh, your busy schedules at this meeting. And we will try to make it worth your while. Um, I'm going to talk about quality control for the future and my subtitle is First Do No Harm. And <clears throat> my concern here is that uh, when we make changes in processes, even in control processes, we need to be very clear about those changes and we need to make sure that they are Im improvements in our processes. We are in the age of patient safety, risk management, and um, you know, since about 2000, this has been the atmosphere, this has been the pressure that is being felt in healthcare and in clinical laboratories. And so the question might be, is patient safety and risk management um, the quality control of the future? In many ways, patient safety has been the way that quality has been translated to be something concrete and understandable in medicine. And that's very useful, but is it the right definition? Is it the right concept? Does it lead to the right control processes? Um, some of you know I am Scandinavian by descent and I can't give a talk without using some of my relatives to help me out. And this is a, a, a Hager slide that um, cartoon that I really like. You should trust doctors more. Our first rule is do no harm. You know, two levels of QC a day. That's the rule, right? Now, it worries me they need a rule to figure that out. You know, is QC for the future risk management or is QC for the future two levels of QC per day? I think it's probably two per day just because that's so much simpler than risk management. And we, are, we live in the age where QC really means quality compliance. It does not mean quality control anymore. Compliance is good enough. Otherwise, why would you be doing two levels a day? Is that right for the tests? Is that right for the quality that you need for your patients? Is it right for the performance of your methods? Do you know? And we need to be able to address quality, I think, in quantitative terms. So um, when we were Putting together this program, Max kind of made up the list of topics and included in that was history and, and Kurt says, you're the old guy, Jim. You get the history stuff, you lived through it. Well, I didn't live through Schuhart in 1931 <laughs> or Deming in the 40s or Deming, well, I did live through Deming in the 50s, yes. Um, but Quality control was developed in industry and it wasn't until the 1950s it came into medical laboratories through two pathologists, Dr. Levy and Dr. Jennings. What's 
kind of interesting about how we do quality control today is we call it Levy Jennings QC, but it isn't. Levy and Jennings introduced the use of patient samples where you did duplicates on a patient sample, and then you looked at how well the duplicates reproduced. And Henry and Siegelov quite quickly modified that and recommended the use of patient pools so that you had a material that was the same material from day to day. And that is what we now think of as Levy Jennings. And it should be Levy Jennings, Henry Siegelov. So if you want to have a real mouthful to work with. But here's the, you know, from the history of QC, here's the basics. Lucky Eddie, you're promoted to quality control officer. Lands there, yell in. If it lands there, yell out. I mean, that's pretty much it, right? <laughs> Isn't this what you learned in school? And well, what if it lands here? Well, just yell. And there is a serious part of this, even when we have very high quality methods that are producing very high quality result and we're right on target, we still do the same amount of QC as for those methods that hardly work at all, right? And that makes no sense in terms of trying to have a cost effective process. When there ought to be some relationship between the quality of the method and the amount of quality control that we have to do. And I think that's where we as laboratorians can make a contribution in really managing the quality of test results. Now in the 60s, automation came along. Some of you have heard the term Technicon Autoanalyzer. Auto I actually know how to run one. Um, that's when I started in the laboratories in the late 60s. And then multi-test analytic systems came along. And that was when we started to see some problems with the use of the Levy Jennings with 2S limits. Because once you start running six tests simultaneously or 12 tests simultaneously and you're using 2S limits, you've got about a 50% chance that at least on one test, you're going to be out of control. You're going to exceed a 2S limit. And then if you start to repeat, you lose tremendous capacity. I mean, these were multi-channel continuous flow systems. And I figured out at one point that, you know, if we could get up to about 18 to 20 channels and two controls on each, we only had to collect one set of specimens because we would always have to repeat and then we didn't need blood drawing and we didn't need the processing. I mean, it was a great way to simplify processes because you never had to acquire another specimen. That's actually supposed to be a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> if you're repeating enough, at some point you never get any work done and every, all your work is repeat work. And it is inherent if we use 2SD limits and we have 15, 20 tests on the analytic system. So the first lesson where I got interested in quality control was with this multi-channel system, how do we make it operate and actually get some productive work out of it? I mean, we were getting yields of 20, 30, 40% off these systems of the original <laughs> The, you know, if you had an original 100 specimens, you were able to report 30 to 40. The other ones had to be repeated. And out of that, then you could report another, you know, same percentage. You can see the amount of work that you go through, all this repeat work because we didn't have the right quality systems. And that's really the background and how we got to multi-rule QC. It was an interest in trying to optimize control systems, reduce false rejections, and at the same time, build up the error detection. So here's a, a description of multi-rule QC. This is the, the non-technical explanation, and it has to do with my daughter, who when she was a teenager, liked to party. Liked to party and stay out late. 
And as a father who was trying to exercise some control, I told her, look, if you're out once after three, twice after two, four times after one, you're in big <laughs> trouble. That's multi-rule QC. And I, I just, as a, an aside, have to tell you there is justice in the world. What goes around comes around. This is her daughter, this little blonde, and, and I'm telling you, this is big, big trouble. And then I have to show this because everyone expects this, right? Okay, so I've done that, all right. <laughs> so then in the 80s, we had random access devices come along and the one that I worked with first was the DuPont ACA. And you know, I'd never seen something that was stable the whole day, I mean, incredible. And then later on, you know, we start to get an interest in industrial quality management coming into laboratories. Um, so my interest started to broaden in the 80s from just strictly statistical control to total quality management. You get into the 90s, we're starting to get the high stability, high precision, high throughput analyzers. And again, the one that I had experience with was the Hitachi series. And the performance on these systems was unbelievable. It was so much better than anything we'd ever seen that you know you just had to think there's there's got to be a different way to quality control these systems. There must you know we have to start to match the quality control to the capabilities of our instrument systems. And in 1991, NCCLS. So for those of you. You remember who NC NCCLS is? <laughs> that was before CLSI changed its name. So this is actually correct to say in 1991 NCCLS because that's what it was called. Um, put together a, a study committee to look at quality control and Roy Barnett was the chair. Some of you will remember Barnett. He was the preeminent clinical pathologist of the time and I happened to be on that committee, and Barnett is a person who I consider one of my mentors. And it's because I learned so much from him through the papers he had written, through discussions I had with him. It isn't that I ever worked with him except on committees, but he's a person that taught me that quality has to be taken seriously. You have to be able to measure and manage the quality of your laboratory systems and testing processes if you're going to do a good job in the laboratory. So one of the important things that this committee did was to look at run length and define for the first time what do we mean by analytic run. Up till that point in time, everything was thought of as a batch. But now we had systems that would run continuously and we were starting to report results on a continuous basis. So this old concept of an analytic run being a batch no longer applied. And so the first job of this committee was to define what a run meant and it defined analytic run as a length of time or number of specimens and it made some statement about the maximum run length should be 24 hours. I suspect that this CLIA two per day thing has some history related to this definition of analytic runs, but that's just a speculation. 1992, the CLIA rules and regulations came out and as I said, from my perspective, that was the beginning of quality compliance, two levels of control. And the two levels of control were never intended to be, here's what you should do. They were always meant as, well, this is the minimum you should do. And furthermore, FDA is going to develop a QC clearance process so that a manufacturer as part of their claims, will put in a claim on how you should quality control the system. The FDA will approve that 
and then you can do whatever the manufacturer says. And the problem that we have is that FDA never implemented a QC clearance process. So there was a major part of the, the CLIA, um, I guess you could say, regulatory model that never got implemented. And that's why in, we're in some of the, we, are, we have some of the problems we do today about quality control. And another thing that was happening, of course, at that time was you've got point of care and waived testing devices coming along, utilizing electronic checks. And there had to be some decision made on, well, what do you do about electronic QC? And so there was a temporary allowance granted for electronic QC until such time as the FDA was able to implement this QC clearance process. And that's, again, part of the predicament, I think, that we have today. 1999, there was the second edition of the C24 guideline, and for the first time, there was a recommendation that you should plan control procedures, essentially customize your quality control based on the quality required for the test, and the precision, and the bias of your method. And then 2002, we get the CLIA final rule. I usually say final, 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 because it's had five editions of final. And it dropped the provision for QC clearance. Every two years, essentially, it postponed it. And then finally, in 2002, dropped it all together because we don't need it. Systems are so good now, don't have to worry about it. And then what follows is CMS coming out through their state operation manuals and, and introducing equivalent QC. And that just strangely looks the same as electronic QC, EQC. And I think it is literally the substitute provision that allows for electronic QC to continue. So here we are today, and everyone knows that you know, we have an issue in quality control. One size does not fit all. Everyone knows we've got some problems. It's just different parties have different interests in how the problem gets resolved. In certain areas where it's very difficult to get the personnel to do quality control, we don't want to have to do quality control. We want to be able to be in compliance with minimum stress on the analytic skills of the operators. In other cases, we know that we need to tailor the systems based on the high quality of the analytical instruments we've got. So everyone, I think, is interested in tailoring quality control, designing QC so we do the right amount of QC. It's just we have a lot of differences in how we should go about that. So what's possible under CLIA today? Uh, it's possible, actually, to do the right QC. They actually say, at, in part of the regulations, that you should select or design the right control rules and number of control measurements to provide immediate detection of errors. Right? You've, you've heard that, or I actually think what they said is detection of immediate errors. I always wondered exactly what was an immediate error. I knew about random errors and systematic errors and proportional errors and constant errors, but immediate errors just never was part of my classification of errors. And then I heard, well, that was what the lawyers insisted on. So who knows? So you can do the right QC. CLIA allows you to do the right QC, but you don't have to. You can do default, just two levels, every day, or maybe just two levels once a week or once a month, or maybe there's a whole alternative way of doing QC. So those are the four options that you have available. Now, in terms of finding some guidance on how to do the right QC, the third edition of the C24 document provides a planning process provides a planning tool. It makes use of a sigma metrics 
QC selection chart. So you have to calculate based on the quality requirement, the level total error, the bias and the precision of the method, you calculate a sigma, and then you go to the tool and you access, you'll see a sigma scale there on the top, and what we've got in this tool is the probability for rejection plotted on the y-axis versus on the bottom x-axis the size of systematic error, which can be also described in terms of the sigma scale. And each of these curves represents the detection capability of a control procedure. So the red one, the red line represents a Levy Jennings chart having three S limits with an N of two. And you can see um, if, if you had a method that functioned at say five sigma, you could see we're operating pretty high up on that curve. We would have almost a probability of 0.9 or a 90% chance of detecting that error. So with a five sigma process, the medically important error, we can control, we can detect with an N of two and three S limits. Now as sigma goes down, so if you look at four sigma, the two lines that are right next to that yellow dashed line represent control procedures with an N of four. You really need to double the amount of quality control if you're working on a four sigma process. And if you get down much less than three and a half sigma, we really can't afford to do the quality control that's necessary to know if the process is working or not. So the sigma metric that characterizes performance of an analytical method is really quite powerful in helping us understand what's the control effort that's gonna be required. So this is in that C24A3 document. So QC can be related to performance. You would expect that. And if you have high sigma processes, you can do QC any way you want. You just don't want to do more QC than necessary, and you don't want to work with narrow limits. So if you happen to have a six sigma process, for God's sake, don't use two SD limits because you'll kill yourself with false rejections. You can go out to three and a half S limits and still control the process properly. At five sigma, you can get by with single rule QC, ends of two or three. At four sigma, rule of thumb double the mono QC, and that's where multi-rule QC should start to be used. And if you got processes less than four sigma, you got trouble. You're going to have to put in a tremendous amount of time and effort to manage those processes. So here's kind of a picture of, if you want to do the right QC, the process is define the quality you need, determine the method, precision, and bias. With that information, you can calculate sigma. Go to that graphical tool. You can select the rules and number of control measurements. So now we know how much QC. Then we have to define when. So defining run length has to do with, well, when do we run controls? And then you've got to be able to implement this in a proper way. Now, run length turns out to be one of the difficulties that we have still today and one of the harder things to really optimize. Now, here's what C24 said about run length. For purposes of quality control, the laboratory must consider the stability of the analytical testing process, its susceptibility to problems that may occur, and the risk associated with undetected error. Stability, susceptibility, and risk. So here's one of the first times you start to see risk creeping into the discussion of quality control. And I think today the simplest um, methodology for guiding us on how or when to do quality control is based on Dr. Parvin's work and this idea that there's event-driven QC, there are times we know that there are changes being made and we need to check them. So the, ch the 
change is the event, and if it's an event, so change in reagent lot that we know could have possible consequences, we've got to check that. But then there are non-events. Um, I don't know where, you have to get Kurt to explain the meaning of non-events. <laughs> there are other things that may happen and we don't know it. And we still need to be able to detect those. So that means that you have to periodically be running controls because something might go bad. So you'll hear more about frequency of control later from Dr. Parvin. So I'm going to just move on to, um, you know, what it, what's the point of all of this? Well, you have to plan quality control very carefully. You should take into account the quality that's required for the test, the precision and the bias of your method as it works in your laboratory. Count for the events that you know about in terms of scheduling controls. And then you ought to run some extra controls because you need to monitor over time how well this process is doing. Now the second option you have is default QC and see this is kind of nice because you don't have to worry about the quality of the test and you don't have to worry about the precision and the bias. Just do QC any way you want with a run length of 24 hours. What more could be simpler? Then we get to equivalent QC. It's a little bit different, but you still don't have to define the quality that you need and you don't have to take into account the performance of the method and you don't have to make any appropriate design in terms of rules and number of measurements. You just run this CMS protocol and if it comes out okay, then you can reduce QC from two levels a day to two levels a week, possibly two levels a month. The problem here is with the protocol. Uh, there are three options, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about option one. Um, an analytic system with procedural controls that monitor the complete analytic process. The protocol says you've got to test performance with two external controls for a period of 10 days. If there are no out-of-control problems, then you can reduce the external QC to once per month. Now, First thing you might ask is, well, how does a 10-day period of stability demonstrate that we only need to run controls every 30 days? And the answer to that is that magic happens. There's something else that can possibly happen, too. And in trying to be on good behavior, I'm not going to say what it is. How are control limits set? Not part of this protocol. Set them as wide as you want. So if you want to pass the protocol, just set those limits way out there and you're home free and you now you only need to run two controls a month. Doesn't make any difference what the rules are. Now, you, d you should consider will this actually detect medically important errors if they occur? Because see, the protocol doesn't test that. It doesn't say introduce an error and see can it be detected either by the internal controls or the external controls. So we end up saying, well, in the absence of having out of control signals, that means the presence of quality. And you will remember a line from, from Rumsfeld where he said, when we were talking about these weapons of mass destruction, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. Remember that one? He was right about that statement. The lack of out of control signals does not say that you're achieving the quality that's necessary. You may just not have had a problem and the control system, ha you don't know whether it has the ability to detect the problem if it occurs because you haven't had to worry about the design. Not necessary. Well, now we get to sort of the current day QC for the future. That was actually the title of a one-day program in 2005 where AdvaMed proposed that there should be an EQC option four. And CMS was, was sponsoring this. And based on this one-day conference, they initiated a project 
to come up with a scientifically valid way to characterize the frequency of QC. How often do we need to run controls? That didn't turn out to be an easy thing to do. And later on, this kind of morphed into a project that looked more generally at using risk analysis for the purposes of identifying control mechanisms. And there were preliminary documents published for EP22 and 23 in January of 2010. I keep trying to figure out when where EP23, the approved version, will be available. I, I honestly saw this someplace in the CLSI literature or website as August 2011, but I've also been told that that's not true. It may or may not be available in the next month, but it'll be available in the next few months. So alternate QC is really about risk management, using risk analysis to identify failure modes and then to select different kinds of control mechanisms to identify the different failure modes. So what's risk? Now we all intuitively understand risk. But when you get into applying a formal risk analysis, I mean, you have to look at what are the definitions, what are the models that are being used. In industry, risk is a function of three factors. The severity, occurrence, probability, or frequency of something happening, a failure, and detection, the probability that the failure could be detected and there could be some kind of a intercession that prevents harm to the patient. And in industry, they often will calculate what they call a risk priority number, where they multiply severity times occurrence times detection. Now when you look at the ISO and CLSI model, it is different. It's a two-factor model, occurrence and severity, and detection has somehow gone away. And, I, and from my perspective, that is a pretty serious limitation of the risk model when the purpose is to develop a quality control plan. I mean, what's quality control about? It's about detection. So how do we characterize the performance or how do we determine the residual risks if we don't keep detection in mind and, and try to work with that in a quantitative way. Well, where can you learn about risk? It all starts with ISO 14971. So for those of you who have to go back to your laboratories and, and tell them, you know, you learned some new things, repeat after me, 14971. 14971. And you just have to say, well, you know, heard this lecture, talked about ISO 14971. 971, and you, you got them. There is no one in laboratories who's ever read the document. So now you can go on and say anything you want. This document is 90 pages long. It has seven appendices, each written by a different committee. It is totally impossible to read unless you have time on your hands, which a retired person like me might, and you're sitting out in your back porch and you have something to kind of pacify yourself with as you're <laughs> sitting and reading and taking notes. I have read that three times. It took me three times to understand. No, I, no that's not right because I don't understand it. It took me three times to see all of the problems and the inconsistencies in the document. Now, from ISO 14971, we have a related document, 15198. Now, that's not 189. So here's another number for you. Maybe this one will be easier to remember, because you know 15189 is the global certification inspection of laboratory guideline. This is different. This is 198. So you can really confuse people. You just say, 15198, and they say, oh, you mean 189? You say, oh, no, this is a different one. 
This is about how a manufacturer should validate quality control recommendations for the laboratory. And that one refers to C24, CLSI document. So this is the one thing you want to just capture a mental picture and you can talk your way through and around anyone in your laboratory. And if you ever, those of you who go to meetings where they talk about ISO documents, I mean, it's all these numbers. And it just drives me crazy, but that's the trick. From 14971, we also have CLSI EP18, which is guidance to manufacturers on how to do risk analysis. And then there was supposed to be EP22, which sort of served as the interface from, you know, here's the manufacturer's information or results of their risk analysis, put it into a format that the laboratory could make use of, and then EP23 was how does the laboratory use that information to design their control plans. Unfortunately, EP22 disappeared. A little gap there, which is, is going to make it really difficult to be able to apply risk analysis because now the laboratory has to understand how you do the whole risk analysis process. So here's some key guidance, and this will help you sort out you know, what we really need to do. And this is from 14971, first design for safety. IVD medical devices have performance characteristics that determine the accuracy of examination results. Failure to meet the performance characteristics required for a specific medical use could result in a hazardous situation that should be evaluated for risk of patients. So things like precision, trueness, or accuracy, all of these performance characteristics that we validate in a laboratory are safety characteristics. And the first step of risk analysis is to deal with your safety characteristics. So method validation is the first part of risk analysis. If you don't do a good solid method validation, then you're not doing risk analysis properly. And then from 15198, the manufacturer shall conduct a risk analysis during the design and development of the device. When they use the word shall, that is a commandment. You have to do this. That is ISO language. You have to start to recognize there are certain words that have pretty compelling meaning, and shall is one of them. Identified risks that cannot be eliminated by design shall be minimized by protective measures, including the manufacturer's recommended quality control procedures. So the manufacturer is supposed to, shall, recommend to the laboratory what quality control procedures are needed for this device based on the risk analysis. So what does the manufacturer recommend? Two per day, right? Right? Obviously, they're not following this. And then another key piece of guidance from 15198. For existing IVD medical devices, Conventional statistic quality control procedures, for example, as described in CLSI C24, are considered adequate until evidence from risk monitoring activities indicates other quality control procedures are essential for maintaining risk at an acceptable level. Statistical QC is seen as one of the generally effective control mechanisms for laboratory testing. So when you think risk analysis, you know, we, we think about, well, this is something totally different than anything we've ever done. Well, it depends on what your understanding is. Method validation, being sure the safety characteristics are appropriate, is part of risk analysis. The design of statistical QC is generally taken as the most effective way to control a process. So what's the point? We need to define analytic goals, evaluate analytic performance, 
select appropriate statistical QC procedures, then formulate an analytical quality control strategy, and it's in step four that risk analysis in the way that it's being promoted comes in. It comes in after we verify safety characteristics. It comes in after we design a general statistical quality control procedure. And then if you want to do risk analysis in a really effective way, the best thing to do is figure out what's the sigma performance of your method and let that guide your strategy for risk analysis. So how do we integrate risk analysis into analytical quality management? Well, we have a framework for error management. And this is just one picture of that framework. It starts at the top with defining goals, selecting your measurement procedure, validating method performance, des designing statistical QC, and then the yellow boxes is where risk analysis comes in to the process. And it's a very important addition to our quality management system. Because here is how we can assemble all the control mechanisms that are necessary, including control mechanisms for pre-analytic and post-analytic factors. So here's how you put together a control plan that really allows you to cover everything. So what's the point? Risk analysis is not something that displaces anything we've been doing for error management. It is something that we have to add to. It's a new tool that we add into our quality management system. We still have to do method validation. We still have to design statistical control procedures. We should still do statistical QC. And then we should add to that individual control mechanisms that are focused on specific modes of failure. And finally, you need to understand that risk analysis has its own risks. When all is said and done, you still have residual risks. And you know, the laboratory depends on the manufacturer to do a good risk analysis, but certain things get passed on to the laboratory. And what is the laboratory going to do after it develops its control plan, there's still residual risks. Do we just pass them on to the doctor? Just pass them on to the patient? A manufacturer can pass them on to us. It's not so easy for us to pass them on to anyone else. Who's responsible for residual risks? You'll all remember this picture. BP, not our fault. Halliburton, well, it's not our fault. Transocean, it's not our fault. I could rewrite this, manufacturer, it's not our fault. Laboratory, it's not our fault. Doctor, it's not my fault. Who has to live with a residual risk? Patient. If you don't have a patient-focused laboratory, we just pass all our failures on, and we hope the patient can live with them. Properly done, Risk management at that second step where the laboratory comes in, we say it is our responsibility and the risk has got to stop here. We have to do our job properly to manage quality because we cannot pass it on to the doctor and we cannot pass it on to the patient. This is just an interesting note. Last year, so March, was the best year in safety performance in trans-oceans. Transocean's history. And the president got a bonus of 375,000 plus 200,000 increase in salary for total compensation of 6.3 million in, for 2010. And this is a little quote, well, notwithstanding the tragic loss of life in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, sorry, you know, we had a dozen patients who died, but notwithstanding the fact that we had those deaths, we achieved exemplary statistical safety record as measured by our total recordable incident rate. Read that occurrence. And our total p potential severity rate. Read that severity. The, the, the risk model says this was our best year ever. And therein is the danger with risk. 
If you don't know what you're doing, the model can tell you anything that you want. So here's what we come down to. We live in a world where we, we need to decide between quality and, and compliance. Quality is about excellence, doing what's necessary to guarantee patient safety. Compliance is about doing the minimum to stay out of jail. That's, that's pretty straightforward. And we want quality when we're involved or our family is involved. And the only way that's going to happen is if there is quality all the time. That means we have to assure there is quality all the time if we're going to have quality when we need the services. So QC for the future, who provides the right direction? Well, as the new ship's navigator, you'll stand at the bow and chart our course. Well, yes, sir. And which end is the bow, sir? So where do you look for guidance? CLIA, ISO, CLSI, or YOU? You know what YOU is? Yeah, it's you. You're who we depend on for guidance. Because you can follow, you can find guidelines and you can follow all of them and you can get this completely wrong. If you don't understand what this is about and what we're trying to accomplish. YOU is still where quality starts in a laboratory. We can help you with tools and training and education, but it ain't going to happen unless YOU does it. Got it? So that's the message to take home, and then 14971. <laughs>